there is absolutely no shortage of problems to be solved in healthcare. And we talk about those problems a lot on this podcast. And every business that exists is built around this concept of solving a problem and building a commercial model around it, right? In healthcare, we're a little bit special. We're dealing with sensitive data. And sometimes people's lives are in the balance. So the decisions that we make around solving some of these problems need to come from a place of evidence and research. And that's why things take a fair bit of time in healthcare. We need the data, the research, the studies to back up the claim, to prove the thing will work before unleashing it into the wild. Well, this week on the podcast, we're hosting a short series of Talking Health Tech episodes in partnership with the Digital Health CRC. And I speak with the digital health leaders of tomorrow who are expressing their ideas, solutions, and opinions from a basis of evidence. The Digital Health CRC invests in research and development to support the growth of a strong digital health industry, improve patient outcomes and experience, and deliver sustainable digital health solutions. And a core focus for the Digital Health CRC is around education and capacity building to support the next generation of emerging digital health leaders and deliver new and innovative learning opportunities for the sector. You can find out more about each of the people in this episode in the Talent Hub section of the Digital Health CRC website. In this episode, each speaker will share a short description of the work they're doing and why, followed by a brief conversation with me to learn more about the problems that they're solving. You'll hear some conversations in this episode as well as the one coming next, so make sure you're subscribed on your favourite podcast player or on YouTube so you don't miss a thing. Let's get to it. Collaboration starts with a conversation, Team Health Tech. Let's make it happen. This is Talking Health Tech with me, Peter Birch, featuring content and community about technology in healthcare. Being involved in a car crash can turn your life upside down. For some, recovery can be a straightforward journey, but for others, it can be like a roller coaster that feels out of control. In addition to this, most people in Australia will need to navigate a personal injury compensation scheme to get the supports and assistance that they need. This, in turn, adds extra stress. My name is Kate Hockman and our research is investigating whether digital technologies can be used to help people readily access support and information to feel more control in their recovery. We are specifically looking at whether a digital, human-like conversational agent can help people to feel more supported and informed during their recovery. Users interact with the agent, which helps them to self-reflect on how they are coping. It provides health and well-being tips, develops self-confidence and emotion regulation skills. The agent also provides information on resources and support. The conversations have been designed in consultation with academics at Macquarie University and people who have a lived experience of injury recovery. The results from our preliminary testing of the program suggest that most people do feel better able to cope with challenges after interacting with our digital agent. We have also received great feedback from users to improve the look and feel of the program. Until we reach Vision Zero, where no one experiences death or serious injury on our roads, this program will be invaluable support to those navigating the roller coaster journey of injury recovery. Right, um, my name's Kate Hopman. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist by background, uh, and I worked for well, about ten years uh, in a traumatic brain injury unit. I've always been interested in how we can help promote recovery um, after car accidents and crashes. The research is really born out of uh, recognising there's a gap at the moment in how we support people's recovery, and that gap is around helping people with their mental health. So oftentimes there's a really big uh, focus on physical injuries at the time of an accident or a crash, um, but the, the physical side is only part of it. Uh, and a big part of recovery is also the mental health and your well-being journey in terms of navigating um, some, sometimes a complex compensation system that you need to get support and services from uh, and also, you know, a changed perception of yourself um, in that time. So I think about the incidences of, car, uh, of mental health after a car crash. How significant are mental health issues after a car crash? Yeah, so some recent research that was done in Queensland looked at the prevalence of mental illness uh, after car accidents and crashes. They looked at six months, 12 months and 24 months post-accident and each of those time points they found that over 50% of the cohort that they were investigating had a mental illness diagnosis at those times. Um, many of those people hadn't had a mental illness before and many of them hadn't sought treatment and so we've got this really big gap of 
of people who recognise they have, they've had a physical injury but are not necessarily aware that their mental health is also impacting their recovery and that perhaps with some better support at the start, they might have find that the recovery journey is an easier process. Nearly half, though. That's pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. It's a high number. But it's understandable when you think about being involved in something that was unpredictable, that can change your life, and particularly if you have ongoing chronic pain, mm. means that you have a lot of adjustment to, to do. Yeah. So I could make some assumptions in terms of what kind of mental health conditions might occur after a car, car crash, but what are we talking about exactly when it comes to mental health conditions after a car crash? Yeah, so often there's actually um, a number of conditions together. So people might have post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly if their accident was quite severe, that they also might have depression and anxiety, and often it's a combination of all three, uh, relating to um, recovery not happening as quickly as they had hoped, or also perhaps um, them not making physical gains as quickly as they had hoped. And so I understand the topic a little bit more now. What does this, remind me what this research actually looks like then? Yeah, so we're looking at digital technology and whether we can use it to help support people early after a car accident, helping them to reflect on how they're coping and what their mental health is like and for reaching out to supports if they need it, but also providing some tips and strategies on how to manage worries or anxieties or some of the guilt and blame that often happens um, around having a car accident or crash. Yeah. Why... Car crashes, I mean, it's quite a specific topic to focus on and there'll be some fascinating insights and hopefully helpful as well. I understand a little bit more, but why focus on mental health issues after a car crash specifically? Well, I think for the insurance industry as a whole, they've recognised that this is a huge gap, that people who uh, develop a mental illness after an injury, whether it be at the workplace or on through a car accident or crash, they have really poor recoveries, uh, often find it very difficult to go back to work and engage in their community and participate as they were before. Uh, so it's a mag- massive quality of life issue. And for insurers, it's also an expense in terms of being able to make sure that they are supporting people as best they can. And what kind of outcomes would you hope that would come from this research? Well, what we're hoping is that people start to recognise the need to look at their mental health as well and that, A, if they're struggling to be able to reach out because insurers can fund services and supports for people, so um, identifying early to their claims manager, actually, yes, I would like some support in this space. Um, But also by providing that support, are we preventing chronic or long-term injuries uh, where mental health becomes ingrained, I guess, for someone. I imagine it's kind of a compounding issue as well too, where you've got your, you know, you need to be in the right environment and state of mind to be able to then focus on your physical recovery as well. Is there some of that, how it all kind of ties together? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think that you need to be in the right headspace to help navigate what's your next steps, where are you going? And so I think that the um, mental health is just as important as physical health in recovery. And when you say back on the points of, you know, looking at the effectiveness of digital health tools, what what are some of, can you give me some examples of what that might look like? Yeah, so we know out there at the moment there's some really great online um, and web-based digital health programs for people with diagnoses of depression or anxiety, Um, but often people are not ready yet to to seek those or not even aware of those programs. So what we're hoping to do is have a a step in between where people get some prompting about how do you feel you're coping and then then, uh, linked to resources where they might be able to access some of those great online programs that are already in existence. So I think about some of the resources and online tools that are available. We're not short of people trying to solve issues for mental health conditions in in any kind of environment. But uh, what you, you mentioned conversational agents and other ways to use technologies to assist with this. W- what are you finding in terms of the adoption or the effectiveness of, of these types of novel tools? Because I think it's a little bit different. Is that right? Yeah. So I think um, that's been one of the uh, interesting findings so far from the study is just the range of um, different responses people have had to a conversational agent, so a digital avatar. Some people really engage um, right from the start. Others are very hesitant at the start. And I think, you know, it's sort of timely at the moment with uh, AI and and chat GPT that people are kind of hesitant about AI and and what's going to happen. So I know that we've had to build into the conversational agent some, some 
some dialogue around that I am a conversational agent, but I'm not recording any of your health data and that I'm purely here to offer some tips and strategies. Um, But it's been interesting, as I said, and it's also interesting in terms of ages. So my original thought had been that older people might be less likely to engage. But in fact, I've probably had more engagement from the older um, people than younger people. Mm, Interesting. Why would that be? Uh, I think the younger people are very scared about the technology taking over jobs and roles and whereas I think older people are saying, well, this is convenient in terms of I can access it at any time when I have the moment um, and I can do it at my own pace rather than having to follow a set structure, I guess. Yeah, and like you say, it's, it comes at such an interesting time right now too in, in the current environment where I think everywhere we'll be looking at you know, the impact of artificial intelligence in what we do on a day to day. That's really interesting. Yeah. So I understand the problem a little bit more in terms of understanding the implications of mental health uh, issues after a car crash. But what does that look like exactly in terms of the support that would be provided to people in those situations? Yeah, so the program that we're looking at is um, developing a conversational agent, so a digital avatar that you can engage with in different dialogues. And the dialogues work through um, some processes of self-reflection, asking people to, to think about how they're coping at the moment then provide some tips and strategies on how you might manage stress um, and how you could reach out for support if you need further support. So the process, the technology, I guess, is a digital avatar um, and that you engage in a conversation with. And when you say digital avatar, so like a like a chatbot, we used to use the term chatbot. Is that similar, yeah, different? Yeah, similar to a chatbot. So it does have a text interface, um, but it also has a embodied human uh, character that also interacts and lip syncs at the same time in terms of the conversation. Right. Okay. So there's a physical thing that you look at as well while you talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so the research is then understanding how well people accept dealing with a digital avatar? Yeah. Yes. It's whether people feel comfortable engaging with the avatar and whether the content that she delivers is, you know, meaningful for them or that they get something out of, I guess. Yeah. I've had conversations previously with people about digital avatars and whether you try and create like a full blown human experience or whether you try and lean more into the fact that it is an avatar so it could be a little bit animated or quirky or different is this kind of direction you look at in terms of what the thing looks and feels like or is that an element of what you're exploring Yeah, so it is an element that we're exploring and it's really tricky because everybody's different. So we have lots of people who've interacted with the the avatar saying she looks too robotic, she needs to be more human. But then we've had others on the other end of the spectrum saying, oh, she's a bit creepy, we really would like her to be more cartoon-like because then we'd feel, you know, that not as, you know, recognise that she's a robot rather than a human. Yeah, interesting. And is there differences in terms of demographics as well of the people that are using it? It tends to be more around the people who are familiar with technology. So not necessarily what age you are, but if you're someone who has is very familiar with technology, then you have expectations that this should look and feel like a human and should um, interact almost as good as a, you know almost as if you were interacting with a human. But then people who are less familiar with technology tend to not not worry about it being so lifelike and actually are more interested in in feeling like that it, it um, doesn't make them feel uneasy interacting with it. So then looking forward and thinking about the once the research is done, what are you hoping then like the the outcomes will be? I I assume it's not that, you know, all mental health is now delivered by digital avatars. There's probably a bit of a layered approach that you're looking at here. Yes, it's definitely would fall within a stepped care model. So the idea being that This is really a point where a person self-reflects on how they're coping, recognises if they're actually starting to have problems and then seeks more comprehensive support. So the avatar is never designed to be a counsellor or a therapist. The avatar is there really to give some information at the start and to help people think about, actually, I need to think about mental health at the same time as my physical health, not just as an afterthought right at the end. Hi, my name is Nicholas Marlowe. When my grandmother was 101 years old, she fell over going to the bathroom and broke her hip. And although this injury wasn't fatal, what if she never fell? I'm part of a project developing software capable of forecasting the occurrence of patient falls, as well as medication errors and patient-related violence. In this project, I'll work with nurses to co-design user interface to clearly show the results of this software. 
My research uses an iterative method where I'll bring nurses' design ideas together, create an example, show it to them, get their feedback, and do it all again. I feel this process of refinement is actually the most exciting part of my research because together we're trying to design the best possible interface to give nurses the information they need in the form that they want. And in the hope that these potentially avoidable injuries, like that suffered by my grandmother, don't happen again. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Nicholas Marley. I'm a UniSA HDR candidate. I'm working on the Preharm project, which is a digital health CRC funded project and there's two parts to the project. There's a development of an algorithm that's capable of identifying adverse patient events rather mm -hmm. and that's in the areas of falls um, but then also medication errors and occupational violence or patient related violence. So what we're going to do and the other side of the project is looking at the development of a user interface. So the user interface is basically the representation of the results of that algorithm. And that's my role. So my part isn't the fancy stuff to do with the algorithm. Yeah. My stuff is the user experience sort of side mm. where the results are displayed. Interesting. To go into the into the fancy, exciting bit at the the bit you mentioned yeah. uh, a little bit more. Falls, uh, occupational violence. What was the other part again? Medication errors. Medication and, errors. And patient falls. And patient falls. So is the so patient falls is that particularly in an older demographic or is this more clinician facing? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. look, typically older patients are more at risk of falls and we're looking at falls within an in-hospital context as well as okay. to medication errors and patient-related violence or occupational violence. I suppose those three adverse event areas were chosen because they are they occur, sadly, unfortunately, and they have a big burden on hospital operations, staffing and whatnot. And we found the developers of the algorithm found that they actually target areas which we can get to relatively easily given the data sets that are available at the moment. So what they're going to do is look at the data sets that are available, synthesize, um, get de-identified versions of that data, yes. put that into an algorithm or develop an algorithm based on that as a training data set to then forecast the likelihood of those events occurring given certain patient comorbidities and workforce structures of people on at that time. Yeah. And so then I got you, got you. So that's great that we have this information in terms of the algorithm. You come in almost as like this, this is what we do with it. Yeah. Type so stuff. It's, it, it, it's, it's amazing that we're going to be able to forecast these events. Mm. And that, that, that's excellent. What we need though is a way to represent the results of that algorithm in a way that's meaningful for the end user. Mm -hmm. And that's my that's my side of the project. So I come in from that point of, all right, well, we know we can do it. We're pretty sure we can do it. We're gonna give you this resource. How would you like that resource to look? What is meaningful information that you as a nurse or an allied health professional or a doctor who's on the ward at that point in time require to then I suppose, preclude that event from occurring. Mm. You know, do you want a red flashing light? Do you want a green flashing light? Mm. Do you want the bed, you know, the layout of the ward? Does the bed flash yeah. on, the, on the visual display? Or is there a tachometer? So I'm going to be working with nurses and pr pretty much nurses mm. just to work through a series of workshops where they tell me what they want. And then I sort of synthesise that together, yeah. provide another version of it, and then tweak it, what do you want, what do you don't want, what do you like, what do you do dislike, and then synthesise that down again and go through the process. So I'm working on an, I've got an iterative co-design method, I suppose is how we'd look at it, mm. or how we've termed it. And over the course of those three workshops, we'll put that iterative co-design method into place to refine the look and feel and operational op yeah, operations of mm. that interface. It's interesting, that whole bit of asking clinicians nurses in your mm. case what they want is something that a lot of technology providers just don't do mm. <laughs> you know, and, and it can you can get so caught up in hey you know for, i would imagine from you know the side of creating this algorithm to be able to say think about all the things we could do with this and you'd go off and you could potentially raise a lot of capital and build a solution that that looks really cool based on what someone thought down here about what you could do with it yeah. and it finally gets out into the wild and then someone goes well it would be nice if like like well i do this well i wanted the red one yeah right yeah so, yeah 100 percent. yeah and i suppose that's what's drawn me to this project is, is that we are placing an emphasis on the 
requirements of the end user. You know, we're sort of we're providing them with a solution which we think is feasible, yes. but it's, its real feasibility or utility and acceptance is at their discretion. Mm. So how do you maximise their f- their feelings towards it so that it does get adopted? So then it does become a sustained part of their work process, their work practice as they go to their shift through their shift every every day, every couple of days, whatever that ends up being. Mm. How do we provide them with a, I suppose, an additive resource to their day that doesn't create workload for them, but makes their workload easier and with the added benefit of hopefully precluding these adverse events from happening? And to me, my background's in anthropology, mm. and anthropology, as you know, is the study of people and place. Yeah. So for me, the, the person is paramount. Mm. And having them as the end user and focusing on the end user and the requirements of them as an end user speaks to that anthropology background, but I suppose in the expression of user interface development for yeah. an AI-enabled prognostic, prognostic risk algorithm. Yeah. I can hear a lot of nurses putting their hand up saying, I'll have one of those, thanks. <laughs> yeah. But, the, yeah, but to your point of, to the point that you kind of alluded to, that there are a lot of situations in a healthcare setting that a clinician is almost kind of like dictated by the technology in front of them and trying to build a workflow around or or is forced to build a workflow around that. That's the situation. But we're also in this situation where all of these great emerging technologies will continue to be developed and evolve over time, but they're only going to be as good as the the humans that are involved in utilising that tool, right? Absolutely. Um, so when I started my PhD, one of the first things I did was a scoping review looking at factors about health information technology use in the health professional workforce. Mm-hmm. And one of the common findings, irrespective of the platform that I was looking at that made it through my inclusion criteria, was that if you impose the use of a platform on an individual, you're going to annoy them. Mm. So why not look at the way in which they work and not, I suppose you you add it into their workflow and you align it to their workflow in a sympathetic manner, sympathetic manner Mm. to help them out. But you help them out in a manner that they want to be helped, not like this will help you. Mm. It's like it might, but this would help me more. And you find that out by asking them about it. And that for, for me is about, the colour, the functionality, the information that's, that's provided. What are the elements that would help the professional to use the software in a way that it can, can be used and safely be used, but in a way that is unique to their particular practice on that, at that particular mm-hmm. time. And lastly, then thinking about, you know, that's a, there's, there's a lot of potential there in terms of, you know, if we do more listening to clinicians, we can tailor solutions to actually solve some meaningful problems. What would you hope that some of the outcomes are of the, the work that you do in, in, in this particular research? I've mentioned that my grandmother fell when she was 101 years old. Mm. Now she lived for another, she almost made it to 105, which is amazing considering when you're old and you fall and you break your hip, you don't really typically, and unfortunately you don't really have that long. Mm. She kept going. What I'd like to do, and what I'd like the outcome to be is preclusion of adverse events like that's ultimately what we're what this is about we've found that there's an opportunity to look at medication errors patient falls and um, patient related violence for the purpose of precluding them from occurring Mm -hmm. so I want to be able to provide a set of recommendations that irrespective of the platform at the local health network um, that the interface gets I suppose implemented into we can still align to those recommendations to create a user interface that people want to use Mm. and do use for the purpose of precluding those events from happening because there's patient days and just safety and well-being of the of of patients and the people that we love Mm. i am a disabled researcher i'm a disabled woman in stem i set up my research to match my personal google search history (laughs) we were going to do an online pain management intervention with hypermobile patients, people who have connective tissue disorder, whether it's diagnosed or not. Because I live with that condition that I'm researching, I asked a different question. I said, look, pain's not a big deal for me, but the brain fog and the dysautonomia and a bunch of other symptoms, the multimorbidity and managing that, that's important. Has anyone actually asked these patients how much multimorbidity they've got 
and what their priorities are for managing it. The condition that we're studying is called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or EDS. We joke that EDS stands for everything dislocates sometimes because that's what happens. What we've done is an international Delphi study. We're asking patients and clinicians what helps and harms them in the management of this condition and what are their priorities for management. Because my supervisors are physiotherapists, they thought that we were going to get, oh, we want to manage shoulders more than we want to manage wrists or knees and things. They thought we were going to get a priority list of different joints. But what we found was it's not just joints. Multimorbidity is a big issue. Getting a diagnosis at all is a big issue. And getting connections with clinicians and teams that will actually listen and believe the patients and connect the dots between the, the multiple issues is the biggest concern for clinicians and patients. My background as a data nerd and as a patient, I would want to see that we actually have patient-centred data and that we not only listen to patients in clinical context, but we're listening to them in the research teams. We're listening to them in the data that we're collecting, how we're analysing it and what we're doing with it. As we're digitising healthcare, we have some incredible opportunity to tackle multimorbidity and the patients that traditionally slip through the cracks in a single disease siloed system. The health system at the moment and the way that the research is conducted and funded is focused on single diseases and single body systems. But as we've seen with the pandemic, multi-systemic influence of inflammation, it wreaked havoc partly because our systems are not set up to deal with something that attacks more organs at the same time than just one, that has more symptoms in more different body systems at the same time than just one. Now, the pandemic happened at the same time as my PhD and it shone a light on how quickly we can turn on telehealth for people who are mobility limited when we have the will and the public health orders to do so. But there were people who were mobility limited and needed telehealth for decades before that and they've been lobbying and that was why we could turn that on straight away. With our research data and our policies, we are listening to experts, what we call experts, but there's nobody who's a greater expert than the people that are living with the conditions every day, especially when we have multi-systemic effects and the experts are experts in very narrow niches of specialty, whether that's medical specialty or data specialty. So I would want to see more patients in the labs as participants in the research, the research design and analysis, not just as a subject. I am Jade Barclay. I am finishing up my PhD in medicine but my background was actually data science, public health, and ghostwriting, of all things, back in the day. And my research is about hypermobility and multimorbidity and how we can manage priorities for people who have complex needs and have everything going on at the same time. Got it. Okay. Well, t tell us a bit more about, about that in terms of everything going on at the same time. I live with a bunch of conditions, but the underlying one is called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or EDS, right? Um, we joke and say EDS is everything that dislocates sometimes, uh, but it's a genetic condition. It's very difficult to get a diagnosis. Less than 5% of people living with the condition are diagnosed with it. And a lot of times you usually don't get just one diagnosis. You end up with a handful of them. There's a very strong overlap with um, autonomic dysfunction, so orthostatic hypertension, with mast cell activation syndrome, so where your inflammatory response is really cool but a little bit overzealous and doesn't know when to stop mm. and it doesn't stick to just one. Like if I get a cat scratch, every single pain I've ever had in my life will flare up like an old soldier on the sea, yeah. soldier, sailor like an old pirate, I can feel the storm's coming, right? But that's just because the inflammation system has gone rogue and gone overzealous and not just sent the troops to deal with the cat scratch. It sends them everywhere, right? I've also had, during my PhD, I've had two spinal fluid leaks and I now have the right people on speed dial so I can get that fixed up in a week or two. But 
that wasn't identified either. And the thing that all of these conditions have in common is they are multi-systemic. They affect all of the body systems. They affect all of the organs. The inflammatory receptors are on the stuff that wraps around every single nerve and that encases every organ and that's part of all of your skin and all of your blood vessels. So that goes everywhere. And our health system and our research system isn't set up for things that affect everything at once, Mm. right? And even when you say on one hand, you know, once you've got everything happening at once, how do you deal with that? But right up the front, you said only 5% living... 5% 5% of people living with the condition actually get diagnosed in the first place. Yeah, and diagnosis is like a velvet rope that gets you access to care. It gets you access to services. And for conditions that not in the top 10, that are not the norm, it gets you access to people who actually know how to deal with these conditions And one of the big problems that we found, particularly because uh, chronic pain is a constant thing, if you're dislocating once, it hurts. If you're dislocating a half dozen times a day, it still hurts, right? But there's a lot of myths and misconceptions and things around, well, that condition doesn't hurt. And it's like, well, let me dislocate your shoulder a few times in the next hour and tell me it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. But our pain management guidelines don't take multimorbidity into account because the way that clinical guidelines are written, it's based on the best available research. And the best available research is based on clinical trials. And clinical trials are based on excluding complex cases, Mm. right? Excluding cases who are taking more than one medication, excluding cases who have multiple diagnoses, excluding cases who have had surgery in the last 12 months. I know a lot of people living with this condition that are also researching it in genetics and data science and molecular biology and uh, public health and everything. We've all had surgery in the last 12 months, or at, la- or at least during our candidature. We'd be excluded from those uh, things based on the number of conditions we've got and based on our recent uh, surgery and injury history. Yeah. And then those clinical trials get rolled up into systematic reviews, get rolled up into clinical guidelines that are then imposed on the patients who are excluded from them in the first place. And it doesn't work. Mm. We need to have the people who have multimorbidity either included in the research that informs the guidelines or have clinical management guidelines that take that multimorbidity into account And we need to have a general understanding in the clinician community that single disease guidelines must be adapted for multimorbidity. And oftentimes they're iatrogenic, which means the treatment that's supposed to help actually does harm. And we need to realise that single disease guidelines need to be taken with a grain of salt when you've got a patient that has multi-systemic multimorbidity going on. You mentioned that you, you know quite a f- number of people with, you know, that, that have had surgery in the past 12 months and, mm-hmm. and are in a similar situation to yourself. I would only imagine that if you've got a condition that, you know, is, is firstly potentially difficult to diagnose, but also then ongoing treatment and, and you're not really understood, the sense of community would be really strong within that, the, the cohort of people. So I guess with yourself, with your own lived experience and also then I guess advocating by, by undertaking this research, that's, um, uh, there'd be a few people cheering you on, I would hope. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, some, well, first of all, we managed to find each other, yeah. right? So researchers who have lived experience don't always shout that from the rooftops because disclosure is still fraught even though we're in a like we're inclusive environment that's often just on the paperwork not in practice so before I started my PhD I was already loud and proud as a disabled woman in STEM and as a patient on social media. Mm. So I couldn't really take that back. The cat was already out of the bag, right? Um, I turned up for first day of one project. The Sydney Morning Herald had actually run a thing on, <laughs> on me the weekend before, and so my supervisors knew, yeah. right? <laughs> it's out there. Um, yeah, so 
I was already out there, a lot of people have disclosed privately that they actually ask different research questions because they're coming from the lens of lived experience with these conditions, but it's not safe for them to announce that either publicly or in their own organisations. So we found each other. Some people are loud and some people are not. Um, but I've got two little bits of language that are not so much red flags, but they're they're like yellow flags. They're, they're flags that I listen for. And those are the general public and the word we. So as soon as a scientist, clinician, researcher, politician, someone starts talking about the general public, they've separated themselves from the community that they're doing their work for. And that doesn't sit right with me. We are not different from and we are definitely not above the people that we're doing work for. We are a member of that community. Banks are a member of the community that they're working for. Universities, politicians are not separate from the community that they're making decisions about and that they have influence on, mm. right? And the general public is a term that kind of, it signifies that othering and that distance. So I generally tend to not use it, except in the explainer things like this. Um, but then on the other side, the term we, who are you referring to when you use the word we? Yeah. Right? And I know that when I say we, I am multiples, right? Have multiple, I, I don't just have multiple conditions yeah. and I am a member of each of the community of each of the conditions that I live with. But when I say we, I think of patients. I think of researchers, I think of students, I think of parents, mm -hmm. though I am we in that. And I think it's really helpful to reflect on who are you talking about when you say we. When you say that too, you know, whilst it's a, we're talking about a choice of words and language and some might say, well, you know what I mean, but when you're in a position of, you know, winning trust or or um, explaining your situation, words are kind of all you've got, really. So being able to, to do that in a way that's, mm, I don't know if the word is inclusive or, or at least um, understood in the right context is, is probably really important, yeah. To bring things back to the research for a second, in terms of what that actually looks like, you know, I understand a lot more about the context and the why, but w what's actually going on in the research that you're doing? We've done an international study asking patients and clinicians what matters most to them. Mm -hmm. So patients and clinicians who are living with or working with uh, hypermobile, hypermobility or hypermobile EDS. And we ended up getting 900% of the number of people that we were aiming for okay. in the first 24 hours. Oh, wow. uh, it was actually in the first few hours, but we were going globally so we wanted to have all time zones <laughs> included and partly that's because we were reaching out to the patient community that I am a member of mm. and we, we were reaching out to the clinician community that my supervisors were a member of so we were known and it was very popular so we ended up having uh, we did a very big survey and I apologise to my patients, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still apologetic. It drained me as well. But we got a lot of incredibly valuable inf information. Uh, but we did a survey and we did interviews. We did interviews with 70 of the patients and clinicians around the world about what helps and harms mm. in terms of management and what are their management priorities for managing hypermobility and for general health management and see how they differ. What would you hope then that that research is applied to once it's all done and the work is, the work's never done, obviously, but the, <laughs> at this stage, you know, where would you like it to go and, and, and what happens with it? My uh, opportunities for future research studies section could be a whole thesis on its own. Yes. Uh, Zooming out, yeah. one, I want more patient inclusion, uh, not just who we're including in our participant samples, but the full spectrum from research and policy design to how we're interpreting and analysing our work mm. to 
bringing that work into clinical guidelines. And there's a brilliant program in the States. So I've been helping with the statistics on other EDS research around the country, not just around the country, but around the world. Something didn't exist when I started that does now is uh, national electronic health record databases where uh, locally and uh, overseas, we aren't limited to the trial data anymore. Having real people and real face-to-face clinical data, we're starting to see that the estimated prevalence level of this is actually about 12 times lower. The estimates are 12 times lower than they are in the actual in the actual electronic health records, right? So uh, the electronic health records are showing that's one in 300 people getting a diagnosis. And in public health uh, prevalence studies, they found that one in three females after adolescence are living with this condition that is not recognised by most, by most clinicians, right? So um, I would like to see more patient inclusion Um, In the States, they also have an internship where having the condition is a requirement for uh, interning in the lab. And they've had up to five different people with living with the condition as co-authors on their papers. And they've had the uh, biggest genetics breakthroughs and uh, on the other side of the planet, um, breakthroughs in understanding the mechanisms of like why are we a little bit bendier and stretchier and floppier than everyone else like it's and it's not just joints it's the it's the skin it's the blood vessels Mm. it's the nerves it's the ligaments it's everything is a little bit more stretchy and prone to prolapse and rupture like everything um and yeah we've got some brilliant understandings into the mechanisms of why that difference is there and what the severity of the difference is that wasn't possible before patients with lived experience were also the scientists conducting the research. Mm. So that's my main thing. I would also want to see the whole field approach multimorbidity differently, right? Our health systems, public health and data systems were set up in silos. We, we were set up... We were set up for body count, right? Mm. <laughs> Go back in public health to Jon Snow and, and Florence Nightingale and the originators of data visualisation and all of that glorious nerdy stuff. They were counting dead bodies and counting infections and seeing how many were happening. And then our medical systems were set up to avoid death in the next five days, whether that's from illness or injury. And we're really good at that. But that's usually a single cause and a single disease or a single injury, right? Over 80% of people die from multimorbidity now. That's, that's what they're living with for 20, 40 years. And it's what they're dying with and dying from. We don't have multimorbidity in our clinical research. We don't have it in our research literature. We don't have it in our guidelines that are informing our clinicians. I've interviewed people who just on an individual basis, when you have multiple specialists, and my guys have between four and 21 different specialists in their 20s, not their 80s, right? When you have multiple specialists, they're not always on the same page. They give you lots of different medications. The medications don't necessarily play nice together. And some people get brain injuries from medication interactions in their 20s and 30s, again, not their 80s and 90s, right? So, yeah, when, like, over 80% of people are living and dying with multimorbidity, but less than 1% of our uh, research literature actually takes multimorbidity into account, and when it does, it's only considering the elderly, it's time for a massive paradigm shift for that. So, uh, yeah, my name's Rex. I've been, I started a PhD with the DHCRC in August of 2020, so I'm sort of coming up to almost three years now. And my project's working on uh, clinical prediction models within the hospital care system. So mainly about trying to predict uh, which patients will fall during their hospital admission mm-hmm. and um, sort of hopefully turning that into a decision support system down the track. Cool. So pre- preventing falls, so... Uh, obviously a, well, 
a common issue within a hospital setting that I imagine could be avoided if you knew about it happening before it happened? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, we don't want people falling over. When they do, they seem to go downhill pretty quick. And there's some interventions that work to try to prevent falls. So, yeah, trying to, like, target those interventions to people that are highest risk of falls can, yeah, try to reduce that health burden. And as a clinical decision support tool, what, what does that thing look like? Yeah, yeah. So a decision support tool is really like a system which integrates some um, input patient data. Um, it sort of creates some risk assessment or estimate of the likelihood that that person will fall. It may like guide a uh, treatment strategy like uh, this person's high risk, they should receive some, uh, some intervention to reduce that um, event. But otherwise, it, it, it can be all sorts, you know, like some decision support tools can just give like a um, estimated risk of falls to the end user, say the clinician or the, the nurse looking after the patient, then they can make a decision what to do about that. Yeah. And so you mentioned you're three years in at the moment? Yeah, just about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so so where are you at with the whole thing? Have you, got, have you got something built? Is it still at that kind of discovering stage? Yeah, so um, we, we sort of spent a bit of time trying to get data and like sorting it out before um, working on the actual models. So I'm working on that at the moment, but in the time beforehand, I sort of did like a review of the literature, the existing models that are out there um, and all the things that they, you know, could have done better mm -hmm. um, and that I will do. And then I also did some simulation work where I was trying to optimize a like sort of hypothetical decision support system to provide the highest value care yeah. to a patient. Got you. And we're speaking before about this, this concept of t tying it to notions of value-based care. Tell me a little bit more about what you're thinking there. Yeah, for sure. So um, value-based care sounds like a really good thing um, because, you know, everyone wants high value care, um, especially when uh, the government is, say, paying and they want to optimize to, you know, um, get the most bang for their buck in terms of um, taxpayers' money in, you know, through the through the system and um, help benefit out mm -hmm. to the Australians. Yeah, I mean, if you have two treatments that are, um, say, equivalent, but one costs more, then, of course, you'd pick the cheaper one as a healthcare payer. So, um, really, we try to do the same thing with um, selecting what treatments to offer a society. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that makes sense. And I think about the research that you're doing, then what are you hoping then happens with it in terms of the outcomes and the um, the, the, the what's next with the, the work that you're doing? I sort of did this bit about value-based care in, in two parts. There's one where I was uh, offering like a new method to select a um, patient of a certain risk to receive a treatment or not. And that's sort of like a new cut point method for clinical prediction models. And that's now like published and people could use that method. And in some situations, there's like a huge difference in the amount of like value-based care you would get out of a decision support system when using that compared to conventional methods because conventional methods really optimize like metrics that have nothing to do with the treatment being given or like the event trying to be predicted mm -hmm. like and it makes a really big difference when the cost of say missing the diagnosis or you know uh, missing a uh, event is very different from accidentally giving a positive uh, risk assessment when they haven't got it. You know, like if you if you miss a cancer diagnosis and they deteriorate really fast mm. without you going into treatment to prevent that, mm. then that's really bad. But like if you falsely predict that someone's got cancer sure. and they don't, then they might just do like a follow-up assessment or like another maybe cheaper thing mm. and then you find out that they don't, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, it's not like a huge, um, huge cost compared to missing it. So uh, when those when those uh, are hugely unbalanced, it's really good to optimize um, based on that wider context. Yeah, that makes sense. And so then I think about you know the the what happens next and how this actually gets in the hands of the users. So who, who are these users and how would how would you like to see them get access to what you're creating? Yeah, for sure. So um, the end users could be like anyone working with clinical prediction models or like, say, implementing them within a decision support system. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the these tools should be like as accessible as possible, because like if you release this like new, new method in some, you know, really math heavy paper without any like sensible implementation, then it's like, OK, you look smart in the paper and some people might cite you. But like if no one uses it, then like why did you do the work anyway? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, part of my work has been like trying to make that 
uh, accessible through like a software package and they can just really easily um, use it for themselves. Yeah, it sounds like a good commercial opportunity though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you find that balance of like, you know, getting it in the hands of as many people as possible, but the thing's got to get funded to get created, right? So right. Really, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this this software can be like pretty easily accessible. Um, like it doesn't take that much cost to, to make it. Mm. Um, if, I, if I wanted to make something that could easily like um, be generalized and, you know, make bespoke tools for people and like front ends and, you know, really uh, sexy implementations, and I'd probably want to charge for that. Yeah. But um, while it's just sort of like a method that people can integrate into their existing workflow yeah. and create better, you know, um, outcomes for patients. I, I'm happy to make that as accessible as possible mm. for sure, open source. Yeah, yeah I, I made some software like from an honors project in 2017. Mm. And um, my supervisor at the time was like, oh, can we charge people for this? <laughs> and I was like, uh, I think maybe just having like a really well used uh, yeah. tool would be more beneficial to me in my career than sure. uh, <laughs> trying to make a few bucks out of yeah. researchers. There's something in that whole point though of of delivering value up front and the rest kind of does follow after that too so there's there's a fair bit of logic in that as well and we're in healthcare if you're in healthcare for those reasons you're probably in it for the right reasons as well so yeah makes a lot of sense yeah i'm i'm pretty sure like uh the payout had been better for me this way definitely with that because like it was a method that sort of got quite popular and then i'm sure that helped me get like the jobs that i got after and you know it's helping me now for sure yeah for more content and community about technology and healthcare, visit talkinghealthtech.com.